Right, so welcome to the second talk in the series of uh, online uh, presentations uh, uh, offered through our airworthiness and maintenance specialist group in the Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, my name is Kyriakos Kourousis. I'm the chair of the committee uh, of the airworthiness and maintenance specialist group. Uh, Today, uh, we'll have the opportunity to uh, discuss another uh, matter of uh, contem contemporary importance for continuing airworthiness and how we can manage that efficiently and effectively, and effectively means uh, safely. Um, so first of all, some practical uh, matters in relation to this, uh, this talk. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this talk. Some uh, words about the society uh, for those who are not familiar. The Royal Aeronautical Society is the only global organization serving the entire aviation and aerospace community uh, as both a, a learned society and a professional engineering institution. Uh, as such, the society is independent, evidence-based and authoritative, relying on a body of knowledge uh, going back more than 150 years. The society plays a leading role in influencing opinion on aviation and aerospace matters through various means, including publications, social media profile, interaction with government, and an extensive uh, events program. Uh, our group, the Airworthiness and Maintenance uh, Specialist Group, uh, is concerned with all aspects of airworthiness and maintenance, and the subject matters uh, include design, production, type certification, uh, continuing airworthiness management and maintenance of aircraft and related components, and incorporates the personnel and organizations involved in, with such uh, products and processes. Uh, the group is led by a committee which provides inspiration and leadership strategies for the aerospace industry to consider. The committee assists the society with the development of the aerospace industry and its people. As a committee, we organize events, visits, we contribute articles to the aerospace magazine or government consultations, and uh, we welcome volunteers to get involved in planning or writing for any of these activities. You can get in touch with the site at uh, our dedicated uh, uh, web uh, site, and uh, there is also an email, but uh, we'll have the opportunity to, do, uh, to talk about that at the end of the presentation, perhaps. So I would like uh, now to present our guest speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Uh, James Seamus Clare is uh, presently employed in the aviation regulatory domain. Prior to taking up his role, current role uh, over 15 years ago, he has held a number of aviation industry positions in engineering, quality assurance and maintenance management in the preceding two decades. Dr. Clare uh, has a PhD from the University of Limerick and his current research interests cover uh, continued airworthiness, learning from incidents and regulatory development. So uh, I would like to uh, thank Seamus for uh, giving the giving us the opportunity to discuss this important topic today. And Seamus, the floor is yours. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen and you can share your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kyriakos. How's that looking? Fine. OK. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this evening's talk. Uh, I would just like to say thank you to the Royal Aeronautical Society for the opportunity uh, to share uh, the research here this evening. Um, after that fine uh, uh, introduction by Kyriakis, I don't believe uh, there's any need for me to uh, reintroduce myself. Uh, the title of this evening's talk is "Looking, uh, Learning from Incidents in a Continuing Awareness Environment. And um, this project, as part of PhD, recent PhD research, um, it involved examining how learning happens in the continuing awareness domain. And some um, tasks involved with that research were the uh, design and piloting of a data collection instrument, uh, with the help of focus group activity, a systematic literature review and analysis with the support of Invivo software, um, quite a, an extensive uh, data collection exercise um, cutting across eight organizations, featuring uh, interviews with 34 participants, generating almost 1,000 pages of transcripts from 40 hours of audio. And this was also uh, collated and analyzed with the support of Invivo. And of course, there was some 
domain regulatory requirement content analysis. So I think we can skip through that. So uh, at, at the end of the uh, presentation, uh, we will have looked at the study background. We'll have touched on the research questions. Um, we'll just also touch on the methodology and uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on the results, uh, just going down through the main kind of results. Um, we'll feature the novelty of the research, uh, the possible significance uh, to industry and um, further research uh, that this uh, body of work could help with. So just in addition uh, to the research uh, that we performed, uh, I was lucky enough uh, with my supervisor, uh, Kyriakis, uh, to publish four um, four papers in quite quite reasonably good journals. And I'll just skip through them very quickly. Uh, the first paper uh, up there on the screen is a paper that looked at more or less the outputs from the content analysis of the regulations it looked at the regulation, the practice, and featured some of the gaps um, that are evident within uh, the regulatory requirements within the domain. Uh, the next paper, it's a qualitative study of continuing awareness sector, which really features uh, most of the research performed. Uh, that paper more or less covers it all. Um, the third paper, it was an analysis of cunning awareness requirements under the prism of learning framework. So there were a number of approximately 200 um, mandatory occurrence reports, uh, de-identified reports, uh, analysed, and the outputs from that analysis was aligned with a learning taxonomy um, to just show how um, learning could be aligned with an existing taxonomy. And this was also viewed through the prism of a learning framework that came up during the research and there will be more about that later towards the end of uh, the uh, presentation and the, the final paper was the systematic literature review so it was evident early in play uh, during the work that there was very little information in relation to learning from incidents within this particular part of uh, the industry so um, the systematic literature review recounts a lot of the activity around that and we'll also get a snapshot of that as we go down through the methodology. So just very briefly the background for the study. Um, you know I think many of us will realise from what we read um, either from ICAO or some of the main um, manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers that you know aviation and the associated activities are projected to increase within the next two decades. So therefore, the current regulatory oversight systems, they may not continue to be effective. Um, so anyway, um, although recently uh, Part M or it became Part CAMO uh, for continuing awareness, and there's the introduction of um, risk-based methodologies in there, uh, anchoring SMS and so on and so forth. And this will come for part 145 eventually, but uh, effectively uh, the big picture would seem uh, that oversight will be discharged uh, through a conduit of predominantly risk-based methodologies. So uh, learning from incidents would seem to be a little bit undervalued, but by looking at it and considering uh, the benefits of learning from incidents, it, it could help augment these methodologies and help organisations and regulatory authorities mitigate uh, the, the prevalent risks to some degree. So as I just mentioned earlier, there was a scarcity of review, review publications when it came to this subject in the uh, continuing awareness um, environment. So when we looked at learning from incidents, we considered uh, that it's a useful approach when examining past events uh, and developing measures to prevent uh, uh, issues recurring. And we also noted that, you know, reporting of incidents uh, is quite well appointed within the industry, but the outputs from those reporting uh, efforts, it's, it's very unclear uh, how they're being applied to best effect uh, within the subject area. So 
when we eventually got going on the research, uh, we had some research objectives. Um, one of them was to review the current literature and identify how learning from incidents occurs uh, within the area. Uh, we had hoped to do this and we did successfully interview a sample of professionals working in the area um, and discover how learning from incidents is achieved within their organisations. And we also wanted to identify obstacles to learning. So from, from those uh, objectives came, excuse me, some questions. So specifically, we were looking at what local mechanisms enable learning from incidents in the operational environment, what obstacles to learning from incidents are experienced, and why do obstacles to learning from incidents exist? So as I mentioned uh, just at the beginning, uh, how the study was, was um, uh, composed, how it was developed and put together, in order to, uh, as many of you will know, uh, to put together a study um, that's robust and rigorous and that can be used to, to reproduce uh, your outputs at a later stage, it's wise to have some form of methodology and structure. So we knew that um, we could explore how various uh, situations impact the learning from incidents. Uh, during the development of the methodology, we needed to look at what constituted knowledge and how could we understand it, and also uh, balanced against what constitutes the reality of the area uh, that you're examining and how can we understand the existence of those points that arise for us. So we therefore consider culture as a, as a reality, a subjective reality, and we recognise that it existed to the extent perceived by our, our observations. So it was a body of qualitative research and uh, the data was thematically analysed and, as I mentioned earlier, uh, content analysis um, of uh, the regulatory requirements was also performed. So this, to a large degree, uh, informed our, our research methods, which we'll touch on in a couple of moments. So at a point before we gathered data, we had to look and ensure that we had a robust data analysis strategy. So we knew that there would be varying levels of abstraction throughout our data from uh, the, um, the um, uh, analysis evident during the processing of the transcripts. And this would begin with a low level of interpretation uh, during the stories or data that was being gathered uh, during the interview phase to higher levels of analysis uh, where we would need to generate a report uh, in the form of findings at the end. So we also had um, focus groups uh, supporting um, a, a, another facet of the research. And we also considered the impact of regulatory requirement. So effectively, uh, our approach was an interpretive exploratory approach. So just jumping ahead, uh, this is um, a, just a, a quick um, snapshot taking from the thesis and it just shows where everything sits and the way we chose to represent it was a kind of a closed loop uh, situation so uh, the epistemology um, was going to have a very strong influence on the methodology and the methodology upon the methods how the data was collected uh, we had defined an analysis uh, strategy and we knew how we were going to deal with our research outputs so I like to represent that as a, as a closed loop um, uh, scenario. So just touching on the methods, uh, this very clearly shows uh, that we uh, performed systematic literature review, thematic analysis, our focus groups, interviews and content analysis. And that's really where it sits in, in the structure. And then just on the right there, it's, it's, um, it's not really needed for this uh, presentation, but it just shows how this information was synthesized uh, later in the uh, thesis document. So the systematic literature review, it um, occurred, the, the, um, the information that came back occurred as a result of searching a number of databases, four or five databases with uh, predefined search terms like learning from incidents, learning from experience, safety management systems, continuing awareness and so on. And that brought back a, a thousand uh, plus publications. Um, in order to distill them somewhat, there was a practical screen of the title and the abstract, which 
brought the body of documents down to 289. These were further screened. Um, these were further screened, and it was noted that that subset, or that cohort of documents, uh, comprised of two subsets: a primary uh, subset and a secondary subset. Uh, we decided to use uh, the primary publications because we felt uh, they were of, of a higher value and higher content because the authors were featuring uh, their own uh, data and, and research. So we applied uh, um, inclusion and exclusion criteria and this um, further distilled uh, the uh, number of publications to 18. And it was those 18 publications uh, that were uploaded to Envivo uh, which is a software package uh, which doesn't do any analysis for you, but it helps you slice and dice uh, the uh, data once you have it loaded. You can uh, search for particular terms or the occurrence and sequence and pattern of different uh, words and phrases, and you can collate them into uh, different folders uh, that are known as nodes in the system. So from this, we had three teams which we later used um, as part of uh, the uh, data gathering instrument. And it's also interesting to note that while this was going on, we were also doing the uh, focus group uh, interviews in the background, and we had two themes arising from those efforts. So just touching on focus groups, again, we had to introduce a degree of robustness and rigor um, that we could show that it was bona fide uh, study. And we had three sessions uh, of focus group. It was moderated by the researcher. Uh, a formal approach was applied. Uh, statements and recurring uh, terms uh, were um, recorded. And two themes, root cause and reporting, arose. So uh, as I just mentioned, the five themes then that came out of the literature review and the focus group activity were used to uh, develop uh, the semi-structured interview template. And this template then was piloted uh, with the focus group and further refined. So the uh, thematic analysis, um, again, uh, a, a very good system, uh, we felt, uh, that had been written about by two academics, Braun and Clark. It comprised of six stages made up of eight phases. Um, and this was um, uh, merged with um, information uh, that I gleaned from a number of in vivo courses that I had attended, information in terms of best practice, handling data and analyzing and coding. So um, academics will say that uh, thematic analysis involves breaking the data down into discrete incidents or units and coding them down into categories. So the process, while it is relatively simple, it just takes quite a bit of work uh, to perform it and to perform it well. So uh, it, it requires inputs such as familiarization of data, generating initial codes, searching for themes, uh, reviewing themes, uh, defining and naming themes, and then out of it all, uh, the information that comes out is checked and synthesized uh, into a report, which forms the basis really of the study findings. The content analysis, again, uh, it was the subject of a, a robust approach. Um, these authors here, Okolai and Scrabam, 2010, uh, they were used as the guiding light uh, for uh, performing the work. Uh, the operational activity, i.e. the continuing awareness domain, um, it, it's obviously moderated by very specific regulations and recommended practice. So therefore, there was quite a static architecture uh, and um, it was easy to set the parameters for the documents uh, that would be included in the review. So documents such as ICAO documents, domain EU, uh, EU uh, regulatory requirements such as 376 and 1321 and 965 and so on, uh, they were all included and then non-legislative publications were excluded. So just um, to show you uh, the architecture of the uh, study results, how we got to the point we got to. Uh, on the right hand side, if you can make it out, this is phase five, one of the phases uh, arising out of the thematic analysis as defined by, by Braun and Clark. And you can see that there are three main headings here. Um, the, the interview data 
um, they were distilled down to learning process, learning product and learning from incidents, and subsequently made up of a number of uh, sub-level headings. So you, you can see where the interview template on the left hand side, you will remember that that was developed as a result of literature review and the focus group work. Um, there were five themes arose, learning from incidents, precursors, just culture and reporting. And um, so the outputs from that were analysed uh, thematically, as I say, learning from incidents, learning process, and learning product, uh, uh, where the three kind of guiding lights arising from phase five. And then the results were structured and written up in accordance with the dark grey uh, box content, the incident information storage and processing, single loop, double loop and deutero learning and effectiveness and type of knowledge. And we will touch on the single loop, double loop and deutero learning because we found it was quite significant uh, in terms of an enabler for learning um, during the, the uh, work. So I just show you this here not to to um, get too bogged down in it, but you can see the learning from incidents, the learning process and the learning product. That was kind of the main three main pillars of the findings. And as I say, I'm not going to get into them now because we'll touch very shortly on the highlights of the findings. But uh, that's how they how they uh, were um, shown uh, as I uh, distilled the information coming out of uh, phase five. So. Just a, a summary of the results. So this was information uh, that came up as a result of the um, the interviews and the data gathering efforts. So there's a thing called continuation training. Many of us would be familiar with it in uh, the uh, aircraft maintenance and continuous wordiness world. It's a mandated uh, uh, training content that all staff must receive uh, within a two year period. So we found that this was pivotal in enabling uh, domain learning, as well as the existence of a just culture. Uh, if in organisations uh, where it was suggested that maybe just culture could have been better, uh, this possibly correlated with uh, poor learning outcomes. Again, causation of events. Uh, there are many smart tools out there, simple tools like five whys and consistent approaches to developing causation, which one would assume would generate a, a very good lesson uh, by matching the actual causation uh, with uh, the event, the occurrence of the event. But we found that poor event causation, of course, detracted from learning. Uh, as I said earlier, there were different levels of learning evident, and often there was a poor focus on the learning product. So inherent in in the writings uh, that require uh, um, the reporting of incidents and learning uh, there's kind of a, a, an implicit life cycle it's not really written down within the regulations but if you follow all of the um, if you follow all of the um, inputs that you're supposed to follow and address you can record it as an incident life cycle and we'll, we'll see that in a few moments uh, but there was a poor focus on the learning product in that life cycle. And interestingly enough, speaking with everybody, the um, 34 participants, everybody espoused uh, to the release of a safe aviation product. So whether there were people in the quality assurance department, uh, continuing awareness management, uh, store staff, uh, people training apprentices, everybody espoused to the release of a safe aviation product. So. Um, the content of the analysis, uh, content analysis of the uh, regulations, excuse me, also revealed the absence of minimum competence requirements for human factors trainers. Strangely enough, um, none of the uh, domain requirements uh, suggest the minimum requirements for trainers. Certifying staff, yes, um, of course, they have uh, minimum requirements uh, and post holders. Um, there was also a lack of guidance um, on the standard approach to causation analysis. Uh, there's a lot about culture here and there uh, throughout um, company uh, procedures and uh, regulatory requirements, um, but there's no guidelines on 
what qualifies as a just culture, uh, how you can uh, determine what's a strong just culture or the existence of a safety culture as such. So there's a, a lack of consistency and information there. And the simple life cycle approach uh, is also reflected in the domain requirements. And we'll have a look at that uh, in, in a couple of slides time. But I, I mentioned earlier that there were three levels of learning evident. Uh, so single loop learning was a phrase coined, as far as I can establish, by uh, two folks called Argyris and Sean, and they have a lot of information written about learning. And they would say that it's about connecting uh, a strategy for action with a result. So to break that down into simple terms, how we came across uh, single loop learning or um, uh, was, uh, we noted that there were situations recounted where somebody say, for example, uh, performing line maintenance. Uh, there's quite a bit of pressure there. There's commercial considerations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the aircraft should be released safely and the correct actions taken. But sometimes uh, um, there will be actions taken to release an aircraft and albeit quite um, quite compliant and so on and so forth. Um, but those actions taken in that environment aren't really recorded or coded. So in a sense, it can be a lost opportunity for learning. So that was a, a kind of, I suppose, we call it a find and fix. So people might often even develop workarounds or minor deviations to make things work. And they might be compliant also, but the find and fix uh, was something where we found that there was some value in it if it could be uh, codified and recorded. So the second level of learning was the most prevalent. So that double loop learning, um, it relates to learning that takes place and it can often result in organizational norms, behaviors, procedures, or the theory in use being altered. So prime examples of that would be um, somebody is performing a task in a continuing awareness environment or a maintenance environment. Um, they find um, there is a need to have it changed or to highlight the working practices. They highlight that through possibly incident reporting or uh, by direct uh, representation to quality assurance or technical management. A review takes place. Uh, the behavior or the procedure or the environment or the resource is altered and it changes things and makes things better. So continuation training uh, really provides an effective platform for this, for the delivery of those lessons. And, and that was a very strong message uh, throughout all of our all of our work. Um, and it appeared to be the predominant means of supporting learning from incidents uh, in the sector. So the third and final level of learning, it's often called a uh, third loop or third level. Uh, but a gentleman called Bateson in 1972 coined this phrase, a uh, Jutero learning. And it really features uh, situations where members of an organization or at an organizational level, uh, somebody reflects on how good that organization is on learning, uh, how good they are, how they develop learning, um, you know, and where things can be improved. So it could be stated as learning how to learn by seeking to improve uh, the single and double loop, loop learning um, efforts. So some of the respondents suggested that uh, an increase in reporting of non-mandatory issues might augment um, learning uh, in, in this area, but it wasn't, um, it, 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 it was something uh, just suggested by, by uh, uh, one cohort of uh, respondents. So, this is the model that's really embedded in uh, the reporting requirements in, in uh, within the domain uh, regulations. So it's quite self-explanatory, but whatever activities you're pursuing, an incident can occur. It may go to an incident gatekeeper in the larger organizations, uh, you know, to check um, to check its content and so on and so forth, and possibly for reporting outside of the organization. But uh, the requirements, the reporting requirements allow a person to report directly uh, to uh, an EU safety reporting portal uh, in this part of the world. So the incident gatekeeper um, and the report 
uh, will be processed as per the company requirements or as I say the individual uh, the individual's wishes. Uh, this may often require priority before the release of an aircraft or some form of action uh, to restore uh, a, a safety uh, status. Um, you would hope that uh, incidents will be investigated and analysed, a causation established, the report closed and finally if there is any learning it will be extracted from the process right at the far end. So this is simply uh, the incident how it goes through its its uh, its life cycle. So eventually there may be some lessons at the other end. So the novel approach that arose uh, during uh, this research, it, it's similar to the traditional process in the sense that many of the of the subgroup parts of uh, the reporting process are still there. But what we're looking at is you have the ability to bring the learning product, uh, the output from all of this to bring it into focus early in the process. So there'll be um, the opportunity for many more iterations and the better development of that product. So you can continuously go over and back. And also, as the lesson begins to develop early in play, it may be of benefit uh, to have that information early rather than later. So, um, when we look at the um, significance of this research, um, the primary aim of learning from incidents, it's to support actions to prevent recurrence. It's not about blame, it's not about liability. It's generally just uh, to prevent that or a similar incident recurring. So this work should really support our organizations with developing recurrent training programs by highlighting uh, for example, uh, enablers and constraints to learning and taking them on board when developing uh, training programs. Yes, the research has highlighted enabling and constraining factors uh, to a large degree. And it's not unusual uh, to note that these constraints uh, exist in parallel industries because many of the uh, publications uh, that featured in the literature review many of them, a large percentage of them, uh, weren't concerned with aviation, but other high reliability industries uh, like medical, um, chemical uh, and so on. So um, there are similar constraints that cut across many industrial domains. And if this work does nothing else and it just reaffirms the importance of learning from incidents and the benefits of learning from incidents, it, it will be a job well done in, in our opinion. So this proposed model that we looked at at the end, the re kind of organized uh, group of steps and actions, um, this highlights the importance of the learning product as opposed to the process, uh, because sometimes in the industry we can get very wrapped up in process and in a situation like this, possibly the product is more important. So also we would hope that this work would support industry organizations and regulators with, with a fresh and independent view of their own practices. So they, maybe they might look at a bit of third loop or Jutero learning, where they might look and just say, how good are we actually at learning as, a, as, a, as an organization? So further research opportunities, yes, we believe there are. And um, during this uh, body of work, we came across some um, some uh, techniques for investigating uh, incidents and accidents, one of them being Hollenagel's FRAM uh, that looks a functional resonance analysis method, which looks at the flexibility and variability of the human amongst other things. And, and we feel that uh, with, I suppose, the development of the industry and the interactions humans will have with autonomous and semi-autonomous uh, systems, uh, that looking at the flexibility and the variability of the uh, human will become all the more important. And we do recognize that the processes, the, the legacy processes of, of investigation and oversight to a large extent that we have are probably credited to forward looking people like Taylor from the early 1900s, who, who looked at industrial processes and management processes, uh, uh, trying to capitalize on marginal gains and um, being able to measure that and enhance it. But, you know, as the industry moves on 
and um, it's, you know, I suppose moving towards different technologies and the interaction with those technologies. Uh, if we could examine more progressive investigation techniques, it may stand us in good stead uh, in the future. Um, looking at learning from incidents also helps us realign our oversight principles, both within organizations and from a regulatory perspective, and, and look at those processes and see how their outputs from those are congruent with uh, risk-based uh, philosophies. Uh, it would also, um, I suppose, be something this research, you know, it could be used and considered uh, when developing those requirements, the evolution of those oversight principles at EU and ICAO working groups. When those working groups are being scoped out, uh, some of this research uh, could possibly uh, support that work and, and lighten the load on those tasked uh, with developing um, uh, those, um, those uh, groups. So even if this does nothing else other than uh, help stakeholders uh, just take a step back and say, wow, if we do nothing, if we perform no actions in this area, what will the impact be for our organizations and our people? And in a sense, if, if that was the minimum uh, out of all of this, uh, you know, it might be a low hanging fruit or, or an easy win. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and um, that completes my, um, my presentation this evening. Thank you. So thank you again, uh, Seamus, for uh, this very informative presentation. Uh, I think it was uh, an opportunity for uh, all involved, you know, in this area to uh, uh, to learn about how we can learn from incidents. And uh, I would like to also highlight that uh, all of these papers, I think three out of four papers are available in the public domain. Uh, whoever wishes to obtain a copy of the presentation, which also includes the list of the papers, they can send us an email to airworthiness at uh, aerosociety.com. All right, so uh, we have a question here. Uh, so the question is, uh, did this study consider only learning from mandatory reporting? Did it consider learning from non-mandatory reports, for example, those that might be generated from the SMS reporting system? Um, yes, we, we did come across predominantly mandatory reporting because at the time of the study, uh, the requirements for SMS hadn't been integrated into all of the organizations uh, that um, the study featured. So only some of those organizations would have had an SMS uh, uh, present because they would have been linked with the operator and the um, air ops requirement would have required uh, an SMS within those organizations. But the, the scope really just looked at the mechanism for learning. But we did all we did come across, uh, shall I say, the importance of considering uh, non-mandatory reports. So uh, I think there is a follow up question. In your survey of organizations, uh, was consideration given to the maturity of the SMS in that organization, given that SMS should facilitate a framework that enables learning from incidents to be fed back to the continuation program development. Yeah, again, um, again, SMS wasn't considered in that context. We were uh, we were just prior to um, the advent of the integration of SMS into uh, Part Camo and the development of Part Camo, and while we believe that that is a worthy follow up study, you know, looking at those particular elements because learning from incidents is something uh, that would be a valid input from the SMS system and it could actually be used as a means of gauging the performance of uh, a safety system. But specifically, no, we, we didn't take SMS into account because while we were very much aware of it, it was prior to uh, the uh, implementation 
uh, of those requirements uh, as as uh, as they are at present. There is also a comment. It would be interesting. I would be interested to see how the results would be different following implementation of the SMS. So that's more of a comment, not a question. Yeah, and and I believe, I believe part and parcel of the uh, underpinning requirements from Annex 19, uh, uh, really uh, education is is one of those uh, salient elements that uh, bolsters. Um, uh, that bolsters uh, safety management systems and the implementation of safety management systems. And while the uh, operators that have AOCs and that are supported as they have to be by the part CAMO approvals, um, organizations such as standalone CAMOs and maintenance organizations, they will be at possibly a little bit of a disadvantage uh, because their safety promotion and safety education will need to be bolstered. And in a sense, the whole idea of learning from incidents through continuation training, uh, continuation training uh, could be used and restructured uh, to help support uh, those probably weaker areas uh, uh, within uh, implementation of SMS. So uh, there's another, another question here. Uh, would you consider it a limitation of the model that its input is essentially the work as disclosed through reporting, but not necessarily the work as done to borrow Sorox terms? If yes, how could such a limitation be addressed? Yes, well, if I understand the comment and question correctly, um, this uh, really was just this representation or new representation of the model was really just a, a, um, an antidote to the earlier model. And yes, of course, broadly speaking, uh, talking about SMS and using this, uh, dovetailing it with SMS, uh, this, uh, the idea of SMS and risk-based oversight, you're going to be gleaning more inputs than just those from reported incidents. Uh, there may also be a qualitative component uh, to how you measure safety, uh, through talking to people, uh, maybe safety surveys, and uh, of course, reporting of non-mandatory non uh, events, events that fall outside the different uh, AMC 20 and so on, and the lists within uh, 1321. Uh, so yes, that model as it's represented is limited. Uh, and the reason I suppose it's limited is really as I say, it's just linked to the model that's more or less just implicit within the regulatory requirements for reporting. Very well. I don't see any other questions for uh, the time being, so that's uh, a call for any other questions. If you have uh, anything to ask or to comment, you can put it in the, back, uh, the chat box here. Uh, some very interesting questions, definitely, we had before, and uh, I'd like to thank the participants for uh, for the interaction. Okay, so un unless we don't have any other questions, we can uh, conclude these uh, sessions. Uh, but before that, I would like to offer some uh, uh, some details about our. Uh, uh, our work in the group. So I'm going to share my screen over here. So uh, if you would like to uh, stay in touch with our uh, with our group, there is a web page. Uh, so you can follow that over here from the society website. Uh, we have our email, which is airworthiness at aerosociety.com, and a LinkedIn group that uh, you can join as well. Uh, in terms of our next uh, talk on the 6th of uh, July, we are going to cover a military airworthiness topic, uh, talk around fourth and fifth generation uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, details about that uh, will uh, be available are available in the society website if you search uh, through the events calendar, or if you follow the uh, the web page, there will be uh, also a section there indicating where you can enroll for this uh, 
presentation. Uh, so I think there is another question over here before we close uh, Seamus. Uh, OK, so. Uh, so the question is, can you recommend any reading to learn more about the three levels levels of learning? Yes, yes. Um, will I take that question, Kyriakos? Yes. Yes, of course. Um, a very, a very good uh, book. Well, actually, they have a number of books. Argyris and Sean. Uh, one of them uh, was published in 1996. It's one of their later publications. And also Bateson, 1972, has a number of earlier papers along with the 1972 paper. But the Argyris and Sean uh, book, and I can, I can somehow get the information on uh, through the society. Um, if that person wants to email the society, I, I can uh, send the ISBN and the title uh, to them. Perfect. So I'm going to write again the uh, our email over here. Okay. So to conclude, uh, I would like to thank you all for attending this. Uh, this talk and it was a very interesting interaction as i said before as well any feedback that uh, you may have about the event you can send it to airworthiness at aerosociety.com our inbox and uh, stay in touch so again samus thank you very much and uh, to all have a nice evening and stay safe thank you